So thank you all for coming along today. Uh, it's fantastic to talk about education and the next generation and hear how people can be empowered to make a difference. I think it's critical with a six-year-old daughter, but I'll talk about that later anyway. So just before we make a start, I would just like to share a couple of thoughts and ideas with you. Okay, so. Uh, so Totally Renewable Phillip Island is the community group that I'm the coordinator of, and we have compiled a few events as part of the Basque Coast Sustainability Festival. And really it's to share some of the the aims that we are working towards. Um, I'll talk a bit, a tiny bit more about Trippy later, but I guess we'd like to acknowledge that the Basque Coast Shire Council has been incredibly generous in providing us with seed funding to kick us off at our mission. So we're mm -hmm. um, very excited to have their support and be able to support them in their actions with their climate change action plan, which has the same target as us, 2030, which is very exciting. Um, before we go any further, though, I would like to pay our respects to the First Nations people of Australia, particularly the Bunurong people, where I'm currently sitting in this magnificent land, and our neighbours, the Gunai Kurnai. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge that these lands were never ceded. So we're seeking truth telling and healing as a pathway to reconciliation, which my personal viewpoint is uh, that's critical as we try and fix a lot of the other problems that have led us to a future that could be challenging for the next generations. Um, so what is Totally Renewable Phillip Island? So our big mission is carbon neutral by 2030. So we were just chatting before about the fact that the last couple of years have been a bit of a blur with COVID and restrictions. So we're hitting 2022 next year. So we've got about eight years of action to achieve our trippy goal. And how are we doing it? We're not seeking world domination. <laughs> we're really just seeking uh, people working together, collaboration, co-design, bringing people into the discussion so we can do the human thing and, um, and work together to better outcomes. So just a very quick snapshot of what makes up Trippy. You can see in this diagram, these are our member groups and organisations. We're very proud to have New, New Haven College there as well. Uh, and then we have our six working groups as well. So uh, a lot of these events as part of the festival, we've sort of themed to our specific working groups that we're trying to take action on. Uh, and we're also reaching out to some other waterline communities who are going to be facing a lot of the same circumstances as Phillip Island. So we'll be in Coronet Bay, Coronella and Cows for some chats, which is very exciting. Um, so without further ado, I will stop my share. <laughs> and I will hand over to Alicia James, who's very generously agreed to come here today and just tell us some of the amazing things that are happening at New Haven College. Uh, and we've been chatting with Alicia for quite some time now, and I'm just blown away by um, the positivity with which the next generation is being supported at New Haven. So Alicia, over to you. And Thank you for that very generous introduction, <laughs> sorry. My pleasure. Be kind. And um, hi, Bernie, how are you? Lovely to see you. Yeah, yeah I'm fine. And you? Yes, yeah. good, thank and you. And AJ and, yeah. Yeah, all well, thank you. Good start. <laughs> and welcome, Annette. So we're very excited at New Haven College to have joined Trippy. This happened very recently. And it's so nice to feel like we're part of something interconnected in our community because we really want to get the students out and doing things and improving the local community and being aware of local issues. So I'll just share, I think, first of all, we'll just go to our slideshow here. Just to give you an idea, we've had a lot of really positive things happen at New Haven in the last few years, um, many of which owing 
are owing to our master plan and um, some of which are owing to our school's environmental management plan. So recently we had the introduction of a four bin system and that was from basically just having um, everything go to landfill, which was pretty unacceptable, <laughs> to now having organics and worm farms and um, dividing our waste into paper co-mingled and waste. So we have a team of students, the green team, who um, get out there and do things on campus and they try to raise awareness with the student body about um, how to use the bins and how to keep the garden tidy and how to care for the worms. Now we have had a bit of a false start since the bins came in last year and we've been very busy trying to get over previous lockdowns and then deal with um, current ones. So we're hoping for 2022 to be a really positive year for our bin system to go a bit more smoothly. So this is an example of um, student engagement. Um, this is students planting out at our Protea Garden, um, Clean Up Australia Day. We've got students from different levels of the school working together. Um, kids looking at their waste and analysing what's in there and whether it's all organic. This is some of our bins. And this just shows the students how we divide up our bins and what they can put in so that um, they're really clear on this. And it's just a matter of repetition. We have to regularly go through this. And one student who's an excellent filmmaker has made a lovely cartoon film that walks students through the process and it's very engaging. So I'm just going to take you to the master plan now. Does anyone have any questions about our waste system? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, do you look at the numbers, the, the, the classification numbers for the recyclable? So, well, like for milk bottles, um, uh, well, for PET bottles, soft drink bottles, you need to take the top off, don't you? That's poly and the base is PET. And there are, I don't know, four or five other different categories. And if you separate them, then, yeah, they're better value to the recycling stream. And you could probably sell them directly as a fundraiser. Um, the plastic ones, you mean, Bernie? Yeah. Oh, so, that's so, separating my idea. into the different grades of plastic. And then, you know, you can put them through a shredder so they can be nice and dense, but you can then get onto the recycling mobs and ask how much a kilo they pay. That's a good idea. Uh, that's I th We're trying to get the students to just put the right thing in the right bin at the moment. So definitely separating the lids from the bottles is um, important and um, we'll probably add that to our education. Um, but, yeah, in, in terms of what we do with the plastic and how we sort it, um, there are so many opportunities for that and we have had chats with people from RMIT who use plastic to... Um, create prosthetics and um, the opportunities for the students in design in that regard. So we are definitely looking at multiple things we can do with our waste um, mm. in an integrated learning system. Mm. But I hadn't thought of shredding it and um, selling it. Mm. <laughs> I, I was always that a little, it was with that, um, whatever that program was called with Craig Rucastle. Um, and pointing out that I knew about it before, but there's a little triangular symbol with a number in it. Um, and um, yeah, if you sort them by number, then they're of better intrinsic value for the people that can actually reuse them. Yeah, the war on waste. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. I'll check that episode out. Thank you. Mm. I'll go and that was the school one as well. Yes. Yeah, I have seen that one. I don't remember the exact details, but it was definitely a inspiration for how we ran our bin system and how we ran our audits. We tipped our waste out on tarpaulins just like they did. Oh, wow. And um, 
Not in quite so dramatic a manner. It was just a few bins from several classrooms, but it, we then averaged our percentages to see um, what was turning up and we found that 80% of it was organic and that then informed the process for creating our new waste system. Mm. So what you can see before you now, I hope you can see, is our master plan for the campus and how it will develop over time. I just want to talk about water briefly because you can see here these blue conduits, they're swales. So you can see we're all on a hill and all the water's channeling down here into the wetlands. That's the proposal so that we can use that as a catchment and develop it further as a biodiverse area for multiple bird species particularly and then channel the water down here to where we have native gardens as well. And the year nine students have been planting these out beautifully. So the other thing that you'll probably find of interest is our rooftop solar, which powers the whole school, um, except for perhaps the gas that's used in the home economics room. And we were very excited to get those panels on in 2017. It's believed that we'll pay it off next year if we haven't already. I'm not exactly sure of that. And um, then we'll start to generate our own um, profits from that. So it's very exciting for the school. Now, do we have any questions about the waste, water or electricity side of things before I go on to talk about students and their engagement? Do you know about things called flow forms? Um, perhaps I do, but maybe not in that terminology. Could you explain? All right. I did a trip a while ago to... UK and um, caught up with my sister on the day when she'd arranged um, a day out and um, yeah she said she was taking me to a sewerage farm and so she's down in the southwest and it was on the banks of the Severn and there's a Steiner school there so the Steiner schools have done all kinds of interesting things in the past and they have um, I can't really describe them you, if you just google flow forms there's a company in Newcastle that um, mold them they, they're just concrete mouldings and it's easy enough to do your own but um, it, it's a succession of, of layers with sort of little waterfalls in between and as the um, stream comes down it goes round in a bowl and then goes round a figure eight before it exits out of the middle again and the point is that it aerates the water a lot and so they were on septic and the water that came out of the septic, they pumped into the top of the flow forms and then it went all the way down the hill to um, a settlement pond and then was recirculated again and got a lot of oxygen into it. And what came out of it was, um, yeah, perfectly clean for discharge to the environment. And, and so that was, yeah, black water as, as well. It worked That's particularly well. We, we could probably integrate that into our science curriculum, maybe yeah. not with our wastewater on campus. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly with it, any other runoff that we may have, that would be a really good project. Thank you. Um, so in terms of student engagement, we have a green team in middle school. We have two environmental captains at year 12. And we have a junior school who across the board are very actively engaged in environmental issues. And two other staff members, Karen Fallwetter and Kate Middleton are very actively involved at all levels. And we're like the triumvirate of environmental things at school. And so I feel like we have the, the goals to move ahead in a really positive way in 2022 and our key goal to be encouraging student voice and getting them to take control and to identify issues and we'll just be guiding them and giving them ideas as to where they could take that but um, certainly 
providing them with a sense of agency is a big part of our aim for next year. Mm. And getting out in the community is part of that so that they can feel involved on a broader scale. So would anyone like to ask questions now? It's probably my spiel. Well, I'd like to share something that we've been talking about with Nina Prido. Hello, everyone. And Bernie, it's so nice to hear your voice. I've been reading your letters to the paper for years and years. And hi, Annette. <laughs> um, wow, thank you. Yeah, you've always got something important to say, Bernie. It's a pleasure to hear your voice. <laughs> thank you again. So we've been talking with Nina Prido about a project that's happening coming out of Phillip Island at the moment called Songs of the Living World. And it's a collection of 30 songs um, with an environmental theme. And it's got a very strong intergenerational component to it. But we've got people singing from Community Music Victoria from a group called Music for a Warming World. A musician called Mal Webb is doing the mixing of the songs. Some of them are tailored to the island. So um, there's a song about penguins, a song about the Eastern Bard bandicoots. Um, some are anthemic, some are more generic about the, the earth and caring for the earth. But um, just wanting to let you know, Alicia, um, I think Kate knows about it and possibly Karen, but we're certainly working with Nina about ways in which we might involve some New Haven College children in this project. We've got Ruth Chambers, who's a music teacher from Wonthaggy Primary, and Chris from Inverloch Primary, also involved. But it's a way in which the um, environmental message can be woven in through song and mm -hmm. science that underpins that. Coastal Connections is a project I know you're familiar with because Kate um, involved the grade twos with that from last year. But we're in conversation with the council, Greg Box, who's the manager of um, partnerships and um, cultural issues and, and economy at the um, and we're talking through PICS, I'm on the Arts Working Group of the Phillip Island Conservation Society with the Nature Park as well. So it's around underpinning science and um, the arts and music, <laughs> um, interweaving them into something that can become intergenerational and performative. That sounds you'll hear, magical. You'll hear more about it. There'll be, mm. There are living work workshops, living world workshops. Um, the library is also involved. So... Um, You'll hear more about it, possibly through Nina first or maybe through Kate. But I'm, I've been writing down, you've got a, this wonderful infrastructure of environmental captains, you call them? Yes. Yeah. And, and your green team. So already you've got an infrastructure. And to hear that you've been doing this for years with an economic investment with all of those 740, 740 panels and your mm. bins and your wastewater, it's very, very um, fertile ground for... Um, some work in the community to um, for bridges to be built between the school and the community and the arts can do that in many ways. Absolutely. Well, we're certainly keen to look at ways that we can integrate the different learning styles and disciplines in the older students as well. I assume, is this just with the junior school? Well, we've been talking with Kate and Karen there, but a number of the research projects that have been happening at the park, I think are, are very relevant to what's happening in, this, in the secondary system as well. Um, there's citizen science things that can be brought into play. The park, as you know, has been decimated by COVID and they're just hanging by a thread at the moment. But we're talking there to a woman called Peter Wittig, who's in charge of um, tourism experiences and Kate Adams as well. Um, so there are conversations that have been going about how we might involve um, schools and the community at all levels in environmental issues that do have some um, flow through to tourism events, but it's much deeper than that. It's got an education focus. And Zoe Trippy and the work you're doing there and you've done at New Haven, all of that is very, very crucial um, to this conversation about how we might bring community awareness into some of the issues that affect the local environment and community. We'll certainly be picking Nina's brains about that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for letting me know. Songs of the Living World. And uh, 
Mm. So if you go, do you, do you read the Best Coast Post? That's a wonderful way for from time to time. Yeah. Yes. So there's there's quite a bit in there about the woodlands and the um, issues there that um, are current about how we can uh, protect remnant woodlands and ensure that the Ramsau site at Western Port is um, protected from industrialisation. But Bass Coast Post is a wonderful place and the community diary um, there has events that some of your students might like to be involved with. We've actually got the editor, Catherine Watson, doing an event with Trippy, I think, in a week and a half. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah, so Catherine's She's got her head around all of this. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. We probably, is there a Trippy calendar, like of all <laughs> the different... <laughs> If I was that organised. <laughs> um, for the festival, we do have, um, if you go to the Bass Coast Sustainability Festival, there is the calendar of the whole event, which goes through to the 5th of December. Um, but then bookings are through the organisation. So we do have a trippy event right page as well that has all of the 25 odd events that we've lined up over the six week period. So it is listed on that uh, somewhere. And I can certainly post that in the chat as well as we go. Um, Alicia, I was wondering, because um, we do have an announcement of a Trippy Wind Power Challenge that we'll be launching next year. Is now a good time, Alicia, or would that's fine. Tony's yeah. given it his support. Mm -hmm. um, in what form, he's not sure, but yeah. he's supportive of the idea. Yeah, fantastic. So basically, I might share a screen just for what we are trying to promote with Trippy. And again, this is, I guess, very early days, very early discussions, but looking at how we can work in and help out with the education of students in some of the issues that we're trying to address. So Trippy, I think two years ago, maybe it was early last year, was involved with um, a primary school with a pilot education program for kids that looked at everything from um, basically education from rubbish streams through to plantings and native trees and food and all sorts of other things. So we're looking to build on a lot more education programs as well. Yeah, so I have a particularly vested interest and I always look at the future world through my daughter. So she's currently six. Uh, so Trippy's goal, as you will have heard earlier, is to be carbon neutral in Phillip Island and hopefully the region by 2030. Part of that is 100% renewable, but there's just so many more things we need to do as well. So I think when Trippy and our goal of 2030, I think about what world she'll be living in when she's 15, which is 2030, and when she's 25, which is 2040. And I think there are lots of things happening that we're not quite sure about, but basically I think the way forward, and I'm filled with hope and optimism, by the way, <laughs> um, is to empower our young people. So I think we have a commitment to act, but we also need to inspire hope for a future world, skills to address needs and resilience to adapt and thrive. So I think that's quite essential. Uh, so what we are doing is we're launching a pilot wind power challenge for students. So on our quest to be 100% renewable, partly prompted by the fact that we have a lot of wind around here. <laughs> so why don't we use something that's very local and see how we can inspire students to think very innovatively and very creatively about what to do with it. So we're looking to do a pilot program next year and we have been chatting with New Haven College, but we haven't made any firm commitments either way as yet, but we're looking to um, basically support the learnings of students. So, I mean, wind power is a little bit contentious in the area and we often think of very big wind power, but what if we could use wind to make energy at household scale? What if we can think about energy production through wind in very different ways? So things like garden walls, weather vanes, kinetic wind sculptures that excite and inspire us. So when we move away from purely the idea of 
giant turbines, we come across a lot of other very interesting ideas. So these uh, flower turbines, I think there's also tulip uh, turbines as well that are used. We see things down to weather vanes. We see sailing ships um, that are often a lot more self-reliant in energy use. But we also think about wind and power generation. We think about it as a direct element. So for instance, boats who use wind directly for movement. So there's a lot of very interesting ways of approaching the idea. And what we want to do is not so much dictate the production of a high-tech engineering outcome, but really we are looking at getting kids thinking very innovatively about what they could do, about what it could be. So even something like this. I mean, there's potential for anything quite simply to generate power, but there's potential for power generating uh, technology to do more than purely a function. And that's what we're really trying to promote. If we then bring in ideas and issues such as a circular economy, recycled materials, repurposed elements. It's really down to just innovation and invention uh, for what we can achieve or rather what the students can achieve. So I'll just pop back. I'm not going to talk a whole lot longer, I promise. <laughs> I'll just pop back to here and just wrap up with a couple of ideas of where we'd be looking for this pilot program to go. So first of all, students need to understand where energy comes from, what it's about, how it's produced. Um, is it just for big technology? We think about this region, we think about, we want a future where renewable energy, the renewable jobs market is valid. So let's build an education pathway now, which is what we're very excited to hear New Haven College promoting these ideas as well. Uh, we want to encourage innovative thinking in our young people, and we actually want to encourage manufacture of renewables in Bass Coast, bring some of that industry here. So what we want to do, I guess, as Trippy is both support education. Uh, we, we just know what a, a turbulent time it's been in education lately, stop, start. So we want to help. We want to bring that community connection, but we also want to give students a reason to think about this. So we want we will be um, supporting this wind power challenge with prizes. We'll be looking at getting media coverage for the students and what they come up with, even opportunities and potential sponsorship from people who can look at prototyping for manufacture. So we're really excited to see what we can bring and how we can help make it more than, you know, something that could be part of a syllabus. We want it to be something that's broader reaching and, and more informative for students. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say about the notion of how we, we would love to tie in more with the education. Um, and we're always up for chatting. So we like to hang about. We're often at farmers markets. Uh, we'll be in Coronet Bay, Coronella and cows but more than anything, I think we're just very keen to keep conversations going. We don't want to be silos doing our own thing. We want to work together as community because at the end of the day, that's what we all are. And we need to inspire our kids that we care about the world that they're going to live in. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about Trippy's ambitions, I guess, with this pilot program for a wind power challenge for next year. Um, and I'd again like to entirely commend New Haven College for all of the things that you are doing. I think it's phenomenal and it's such a critical part of the future, what we inspire our, our kids with. Um, I will stop talking, but I will open up for some questions. Luckily, we're not running overtime, which is fantastic. Did anybody have anything they wanted to raise or, or respond to or think about or suggest? I found it very inspiring seeing those different turbine designs. I think the students would respond very instantaneously to um, those visuals and it would start getting the cogs turning and at all ages they'd love to be involved. Brilliant. 
And we have plans for a garden extension that improves the biodiversity of the school. And I can see how some of those ideas could be integrated possibly into our sensory and native gardens. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. I just love the idea that you can do one thing as a function, but then if you spend a little bit more time, spoken like a true architect with a design mentality, but mm. if you spend a bit more time thinking of what else it can do, um, you can get phenomenal outcomes. So I'd love to see that thinking, you know, go even further. And Ian coming with his trailer yeah. when when it happens, when he's able to come <laughs> when on he's campus, allowed. <laughs> will be so beneficial. Yeah. Um, so, Bernie, there's a energy trailer and Ian... What's Ian his? South Hall. So South it's the, Hall. the renewable energy demonstration trailer. He will run education sessions with any age group and he shows them... Um, I think the bicycles that power smoothie makers and mm. or, or a light bulb and a whole range of different contraptions. He teaches students about different energy options and really recent ones too that perhaps a lot of adults aren't aware of yet. I think hydrogen is his big interest at the moment and uh, we're very much looking forward to having him on campus that's looking like term one next year. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. <laughs> yeah, we will. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm wondering whether, um, Alicia, you could tell us a little more about the green team and the environmental captains. What's their parameters? What are the kinds of issues that they're keen to put energy into? Well, we have a meeting. We had been having them every week before lockdown. And the big push in term one and two was to get the bin system working because it was very new then. And that meant encouraging behaviour change and um, teaching students what went where, encouraging them to reduce, encouraging the use of nude food. It was a big campaign. So now they're looking to maintain that, but... Um, they're also interested in the climate summit and what's been going on, some of the decisions coming out of that. And they would really like to get off campus, I think, and get their hands dirty, do something for the community or do something um, active on campus. So we've had our year nines do a, a fair bit of the planting this year and they've done a fantastic job and students from all across the school and the green team certainly been involved in that a little bit and they're also interested in raising student awareness about a whole range of issues so we're looking towards using our daily bulletin for that as a channel for student voice and we've got two green team members presenting on Tuesday at a middle school assembly about a former student, Hewan Smith, who made it his campaign to pick up a ton of plastic that was washed up on remote beaches. And he reached that goal very quickly with his three other friends. And yeah, they just hike for kilometres and kilometres and end up with wheelbarrow loads of waste. And in this clip that the students show it's called journey to a ton if you want to have a look at it um he shows how there are very the different types of plastic as you were saying bernie and um <clears throat> he identifies the sorts of things that get washed up on the beach and where they might come from and yeah it's fascinating and inspiring to see the pathways that old students have taken and how they're inspiring the next group to come along and they're tying that in with a very exciting showcase of one student's letter from David Attenborough she wrote to him over lockdown and he wrote back and said of course he probably writes to many people so it's succinct but he said the best advice I can give you is don't waste anything because that's the best impact you can have on the planet mm. so, amazing yeah, heartwarming. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we might, we've 
covered a lot of ground this morning and we've done incredibly well. So I might just open it up if there's any final questions and then we might let everyone go and either finish their lunch or grab a cuppa. Well, your thing about measuring, so with the Shire and the Climate Action Plan thing, oh, are they actually measuring anything? And are there any improvements to be shown for it? And so yeah, if you go I've been hustling in for a long the, time. There should go, be somewhere on the website it is to on say the website. this is the target <laughs> for this year or six months or whatever, yeah, and whether or not they've achieved it, and if they've modified future targets to make up yeah. because they haven't. And is anything happening? Yeah, I was just saying, Bernie, it is up on their website, so it's available information. If you Google the Climate Action Plan, it was actually adopted maybe two months ago. It's been in draft for a year or two and they've mapped everything. They've got great bar charts that show the stationary energy use and in percentages and tons of greenhouse emissions. They've got well, a whole that's scaling the nature of the problem, isn't it? But there's, Sorry, there's, I'll no, just, I'll there's just, no target to reduce this Benny, much I'll by just finish off because I was just about to talk about that, which is they have committed to 2030 net zero and they have an action plan that consultants have prepared. So they've got household, business and council actions and which one accounts for what percentage. So householders can account for 50% reduction uh, to get to that target. So it's all been analysed and mapped out and, the, and they're remeasuring every two to three years, I think, to see what kind of improvement there is. So it's very exciting and it's great work because it's even the same time frame as, as Trippy in terms of 2030. So we, we can sort of use all this amazing information they've gathered um, and then build on it as well. Yeah, so check it out. It's all online as well. And I'm sure you could probably go into council and pick up a hard copy as well, I'm sure, if you wanted to. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. How inspiring and what a great group of people. And I can't wait to see where this all goes. It's just brilliant. Uh, heartwarming, we could say. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. My pleasure. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Alicia. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. It's lovely okay. to see you again. Okay, darling, we'll be in touch, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Annette. Bye. Bye.